everyone, doing a vlog-style review this time for uh, Legend of the Galactic Heroes Book 9. Um, doing it this way as opposed to the other kind of previous reviews because there's less recap to do this time than the last few ones. Short recap of Book 8. Yang Wen Li and the remaining forces of the Three Planets Alliance have set up at Iserlo and with the nearby star system, have formed the Isolone Republic, a last bastion, in some ways, kind of literally, considering that Isolone is a Death Star-sized fortress, a uh, bastion of democracy in the galaxy, now that the Empire, under the leadership of Reinhard von Lohengram, has basically taken over the entire galaxy. However, the Church of Terror is still out there, and they're not exactly happy that one side has won. So, the big epic pitch space value of this battle of this volume is a last gasp, not last gasp, but one final push by Reinhardt to finally best Yang Wen Li. Not leading his forces directly in battle this time, but through his subordinates, through various ones, um, Oscar von Royenthal, uh, Mittenmeyer, that sort of thing, sending their fleet against Ice Alone to attempt to take the fortress, which has basically only ever been captured by Yang Wen Li. And they fail. Um, they lose the fight, and the Empire withdraws. And so Reinhardt invites Yang to his new capital on Fazan to, or basically under a flag of truce, for a conclave of some variety. It's unclear what exactly Reinhardt's goal here is. He's, he's trying to talk Yang into bending the knee one more time after their last meeting when the Free Planets Alliance fell. Or if there's something else, or if Reinhardt's going to basically say, you have bested me. Um, we shall no longer clash on the battlefield, let our ideologies clash um, to see whether your um, your Iserlone Republic can survive. We, we, we know, find out this out, because a group of assassins from the uh, Church of Terra attack uh, the ship carrying Yang Wen Li, and aside from a couple people, kill everyone on it. Including Yang Wen Li, he is he is dead, and that basically wrap and wraps up this book with the decision. Okay, with everyone kind of reacting to this, the Iceland Republic decides that Yang Wen Li's wife is going to secede him on the throne. Forgive background noise, by the way. I mean, I live near a freeway, and that Julian Mitz, Yang's protege, will secede him in command of the armed forces. In spite of Julian's relative lack of experience commanding in the military, he is Yang's protege, and that kind of leads where we are here. So, this book is, to a certain degree, the reaction to the events of, like, this is all re reaction to the events of the last story, of book eight. I mean, the free plot, like, the Iceland Republic is still kind of reeling. Um, Julian is still very much reeling. He, um, over what happened. And, um, like, Yang's wife, um, I forget her first name. Last, I remember her last name, um, Greenhill. Well, her, her maiden name, Greenhill. I'm actually going to look this up. Frederica Greenhill. Frederica Greenhill Yang. Um, Frederica Greenhill and um, Julian Mintz are basically coping with this, while also Julian kind of having to deal with his new position as the military leader of the Iceland Republic. And as far as my thoughts on the decision to put Julian in charge, it makes actually a degree of sense. We kind of have a setup for this way back when 
after Yang put down the uh, Free Planets Alliance Civil War, uh, he was in for the court martial while the um, Imperial forces attacked Iserlone and base basically. Ice alone staged their defense with Julian as the main strategic advisor, along with Yang's staff, as they effectively set up a battle plan of how the hell do we trick the Imperial Navy into thinking Yang's still here so that they don't try some like really daring stuff, or rather, rather that they maintain so they maintain the degree of caution that they would expect that that, that they would deploy were Yang not here. Or yet we're Yang there. So having Julian Mintz, the person who spent the most time with Admiral Yang, who was basically his, for lack of a better term, his de facto butler over the past eight books, seven, eight books, makes total sense. However, there is also the, the B plot here, and it feels a little rough to an extent. Because we have a second civil war in the Empire, and it's brought about by effectively a failure of communication. That is a civil war, I'm double checking about the book here, uh, back of the book, between Oscar von Royenthal and Lohengram, due to Royenthal being framed for, an, for um, treason and plotting in a, to assassinate the Kaiser, basically. And I don't know what I think about this. I'm trying to avoid spoilers here because, yes, the anime is out. Yes, these books are actually, if you get really technical about it, fairly old. But this is still the latest book in this series. And by the time this episode goes up, the next book won't be out until set, to, which is the final book. Won't be out until December. So, I'm trying to keep the spoilers a little light, as I normally do with these reviews. This plot feels like it exists, basically, because, oh, we need to have a big space battle or a big space campaign, this book. We can't have a Legend of the Galactic Heroes novel that doesn't have a space battle. Uh, if there aren't any spaceships exploding, then people won't buy the next one. When I think what this book really needs, and hopefully we get this in book 10, which was kind of denouement, what I think this really needs is we need a politically political machination focused book. Because the crux of the matter is this, and this is actually kind of the core thrust of the Church of Terra's plan, and also part of Yang Wen Li's argument against Reinhardt and autocracy, monarchy, is autocracy and monarchy to succeed depends on the ruler and how well the ruler handles threats from within, and I don't mean in a military sense, although this is certainly part of it. Um, it's, it's how you handle the internal political machinations, because a ruler has to delegate. And in a democracy, a lot of this is kind of built into the system, uh, built into most democratic systems of government. It is the fundamental concept of bureaucracy, that once you reach a certain critical mass of government, you have to delegate things. And the certain critical mass of government is not a large critical mass. Your average major city for a state in the United States, Providence in Canada, has to delegate stuff. You have to delegate the running of the water department, of police and fire, of parks, of road construction and maintenance. You can't do it all yourself. And so, consequently, trust 
plays a more significant deal. And for anything in autocracy, when it is the when the buck stops and ends at the autocrat, at the king, kaiser, emperor, what have you. He picks his advisors, or his counselors, or his cabinet, or what have you, and has no oversight, and the vetting process he has is solely his own, and presumably other people who he delegates the vetting process to, but again, there's a matter of putting trust in the vetting process. Whereas, for a democracy, if all runs well, which doesn't always, but that's actually part of the point of the whole thing with Yang Wen Li, is when all runs well, your the people who you are appointing to be top bureaucrats, again, the heads of cabinet, the head of your Department of Transportation, your um, Department of Justice, your Secretary of the, not so much Secretary of the Navy, but your head of the, um, you, your head of the military, that sort of thing. Um, Surgeon General, all these sorts of, the posts, or in this case of city government, the commissioner of the sewer commissioner, the parks commissioner, police commissioner, fire commissioner, that sort of thing. All those posts have to go through some sort of public delegation process, public debate, and these and people are publicly, transparently grilled over what they plan to do and how they intend to run the department that they're going to run. Now, just because they're not, if they're shown in this process to be incompetent or have ill ends for the position that they're appointed to doesn't mean that they're not going to get the job. You've seen through the Trump administration, not to get too political. We're going to get political. We're talking about politics in a science fiction story uh, where the conflict of political ideologies is very fundamental to the work, but uh, this doesn't stop the those people from getting appointed, but the process is still gone through and the public knows what the views of these people are when they take office, and thus consequently, in turn, if the person who appointed them, or the people who appointed them, are determined to have done ill by the people, by choosing these people, then those people can be replaced, and the people appointed those positions can be replaced. Similarly, if they're directly elected as well, there could be recall elections and that sort of thing. There are checks and balances built into the system, above and beyond the autocrat. Now, with the autocrat, and this is where we run into, this is like the fundamental conflict of what like the Church of Terror is trying to do in the Empire. In this book is that the checks and balances are the trust between the ruler and his advisors and his subordinates. And if that trust is wavered, either way, whether, um, and, and actually I mean multiple different ways, whether the advisor stops, or the, the ruler stops trusting his advisors, the advisors stop trusting their ruler to have their best interests at heart, or the advisors stop trusting each other and start having to put plans and machinations against each other for their own protection, or they presume their own protection, then the system stops functioning successfully. And that is the, like, that is the goal of the Church of Terror when it comes to destabilizing, uh, the Galactic Empire, and the book tries to get into that through the seeds of how this new civil war or short civil conflict is started between Lohengrom and Royenthal, but it doesn't get as much of an opportunity to really get into it because... Ultimately, we have to have the fight, and that fight, when it's happened, is going to be taken to the forefront. And it's not a direct conflict between Reinhardt and Royenthal either, which is actually also kind of part of the problem. They make it, they decide, we're going to have these two brothers in the government have to fight each other. Uh, the two, it's Royenthal who's fo who is framed and set up to, for um, deception and usurpation and all that sort of stuff and treason. So to prove their loyalty, Ryan uh Royenthal's closest ally, Mittenmeyer, is going to be the one who is sent against him. And so it's Roy so it's Royenthal versus Mittenmeyer versus Mittenmeyer versus the Gale Wolf. And it's like 
Okay, so we don't have the fundamental conflict, not just of forces, but also of ideologies of the Free Planet Alliance and the em Free Planet Alliance and the Empire, or the Iceland Republic versus the Empire. Nor we're sort of getting the conflict between advisors being made physical in the terms of Royenthal versus Mittenmeyer, but it's not. It's not between the advisors who I'd actually kind of want to see the conflict between, like Oberstein, because Oberstein is the whole thing going for him of he is the political operator, and nobody really likes him, but he's really good at manipulating things behind the scenes. He is as good a political operator as Reinhardt is. A military commander, which is both Reinhardt's group, which is, which makes for a interesting conflict, um, conflict, and we don't get that at least this book. Maybe book ten we get that. I be I would hope we do, or be interested to see if we do, but it's book ten's the last book, and I would rather book ten be a denouement, considering how book one was, while there were space battles in there, so much heavily focused on setting up the universe, putting the pieces in place so that they can be laying everything out so they can be shoved into each other and everything can be, well, the game can play out. We, I would hope that Book 10 would give an opportunity for that denouement of some variety or another of the fates of Julian Mintz and Reinhard von Lohengram, of the Empire and the Iserlohn Republic, of democracy and autocracy in the galaxy and how these things play out. But for this to, like, for that resolution to really pay off and to feel earned in the way, not much earned, but um, feel like the de escalation. The denouement, the denouement, the letting out of the breath after keeping it in, and sitting on the edge, and the, the relaxation in the chair after being on the edge of our seat for seven or eight books since book two or three, um, for that to for that to work, we need to have this book to address the one last major sort of ideological and, and metaphorical conflict of the story and to, to pay off, to tie up the la the biggest knot of loose ends, which is the political conflict. And to make this work, it felt like this needed to be the book where the Church of Terra really made their push um, to try and destabilize the Empire, not through military force, because at this point, they've never had it. They've always been about soft pressure since they were introduced in, like, book three or four. So, where they really kind of twist, twist the screws on that and try to manipulate things in their end and destabilize things so that they could try to seize control of the galaxy in their intended way. And I think the final conflict on that is supposed to be book 10, but I'd rather, like, if the Church of Terror is going to lose. It, it seems certain from this book and the books before it. And it's going to, they're going to lose in a way that's going to involve an alliance of forces of Iserlon and... Uh, the Empire, because they pissed them both off so very, very badly. But to do this, to make this really work, they have to politically behind the scenes cross the Rubicon in cross the Rubicon, and they don't really quite do that. The closest they get to doing that is to start is to trying to start the Civil War and failing. Um, well, somewhat succeeding. And we'll see. I am in short, like there's one book left, so I'm I'm in it for the long, for the remainder of the long haul. It's there's no point in stopping now. 
Um, but it's not that this book is a disappointment. It's I came in hoping for one thing. I'm hoping after a big buffet of pizza over the pla the past six books, five or six books, I came in expecting something different. I came in expecting ribs, expecting actually ribs is a good example. Meaty ribs to to grab a hold of on the bone and take a big bite out of. Um, instead, I got more pizza. It's a barbecue pizza this time, but it's uh, like a barbecue rib pizza as opposed to a chicken barbecue pizza, but it's, it's still more pizza. And I don't mind pizza. I like pizza. Uh, pizza can be in a large variety of forms. It makes for a wonderfully diverse culinary medium, the same way that military science fiction can be. But... To put it in another perspective, in the Honor Harrington series of books, which is David Weber's epic series of military science fiction, which I would compare in numerous respects to Legend of the Galactic Heroes, the Honor Harrington books, as often as they have big military pitched space battles, and they're books with loads of exploding starships and techno babble over new military technologies and cunning and devious um, strategic maneuvers among military geniuses. They also frequently have very politically focused books all about court intrigue or intergovernmental intrigue, just having a whole bunch of this to set up for the next book, the big battles and the campaigns to come. And with the Legend of the Galactic Heroes series, we've always kind of we've always tried to have both in each book, and it sometimes works, but it doesn't always. And this is one of the ones where it doesn't quite work. Which, if it were in the middle or the beginning of the series, that'd be fine. But toward the end, it becomes very dis it becomes disappointing. I don't hate the book. I enjoyed it. I read it all the way through. I I was riveted to the page through for um, significant chunks of it. But the political machination parts of this book were the part that had my attention and gripped me a lot more than the military conflicts. We shall see how things play out in part ten. And that book's due to come out in December. I will probably have it in time for Christmas, which means... I will definitely have it in time for Christmas. I pre-ordered it already. But this does mean that the review will probably come up in January of 2020. Also, next year is 2020. My God, we're living in the future. Our dark cyberpunk dystopia. So, I will see you next time. And indeed, next month is October... And I am doing a slew of horror reviews next month, where I will be reviewing Dario Argento's Three Mothers Trilogy. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>